Hello, how are you? Welcome to the lecture. Um, today is a, a lecture from chapter two of On Course by Skip Downing. Um, and that is the chapter on accepting personal responsibility. Um, if you like, you can open up the PowerPoint that goes with this um, at, on Canvas and you know take a look at the slides as we go through. But I'm not going to go through every slide. I'm just going to go through the important things that I want you to take away. Um, I would say this is one of the more important lectures uh, during the over the course of the semester because this is the first lecture that actually incorporates. Um, what we're going to be really doing in this class. So up to now, we've covered lots of other things like study skills and just basics. But now we're really getting into the meat of the course, which is about you know your personal self and how you will accept the personal responsibility that goes with being you. And um, we'll talk about what happens if you don't do that. And yeah, maybe you can look around and see some of the people around you and kind of where they're at in that process. Because just because you grow up physically doesn't mean that you grow up emotionally, mentally, or, you know, any other way. So you have to grow yourself up. It's part of the process of becoming, you know, an adult. And so there may you may have an adult body, but maybe you're not quite an adult in terms of, you know, how you're treating yourself and how you're approaching your future. So let's uh, let's take a look at that. So I want to start on page 47 um, in your book. So <laughs> it looks like this. And it's also on the PowerPoint. Um, let me see which slide it is. Here we go. It's slide number four. So either way, I just want to have this in front of you. So you'll notice that it starts at the top with uh, a stimulus. And the stimulus can be anything, guys. It could be, you know, you got in a car accident on the way to school. It could be, um, you know, somebody stole your lunch. <laughs> it could be you you got married and you, you're you going on your honeymoon. Um, it could be anything. And that's the point here is that the stimulus literally could be anything. Then next you have a choice. How are you going to respond to or react to that particular stimulus and there are victim choices and there are creator choices and you can see there's kind of a little branching off here so on one side it's the victim choices and on the other side it's the creator choices but up here you know the stimulus is the same but there's two different ways to react to it according to skip downing in on course okay so the victim mindset let's start with that so <laughs> we all have some victims that we know right um, the thing about victims is they get something out of being a victim. They do. Um, what it might be may be different for each victim, but for a lot of them, it's sympathy or attention that they're seeking. And the way that they get attention is by having bad things happen to them, complaining about those bad things, and then having other people react to those negative things that have happened and, um, you know, feel sorry for them. They don't really want constructive criticism. They don't really want help. They don't really want to be told how they can change. They just want to complain. And they would like sympathy. And no matter how many times you try to help a victim, they're always going to remain helpless because they're never going to actually do anything that will change the situation that they're in because they're getting something out of that situation, which is maybe sympathy, but they're getting to play the victim. And for some people, playing the victim is their comfort zone. It's what they find most comfortable and helpful. Maybe they don't even know there's another way that they can do things. So the thing about victims is that they often don't take responsibility for their behavior. So they're always pointing the finger at somebody else like, oh, he did it, he did it, he did it. It's not my fault because, it's not my fault because. Or they're taking responsibility for stuff that isn't even theirs. They're like, you know, COVID-19 is my fault, you know, <laughs> kind of stuff. And it's like they feel bad because they really think they caused this. I don't know. Um, 
they're always making excuses as to why things aren't getting better in their life. Like, there's always a reason. And they keep repeating the same stupid behaviors over and over and over and over. So, like, if you know that one girl that's always dating that same horrible guy, you know, she dumps him and then there's another horrible guy and then she dumps him and there's another horrible guy. And you're like, why does she keep choosing these bad guys? It's like, because she's a victim and she doesn't want to change and she doesn't feel like she deserves any better. And the result of being a victim is that things don't really change or progress. You kind of stay stagnant and you're just in the same negative cycle over and over and over and over again and they rarely achieve their goals because there's always some reason something preventing them from doing what they want to do or moving towards what they want to move towards so if you are a victim or if you're right now sitting here watching this going am i a victim before I, before we get too crazy and wrapped up in this, I want you to know that everybody is a victim sometimes about certain things. There's no person that's never been a victim ever. So even though like you may think that this applies to like your whole personality and like either you're a victim or a creator, it's really not that simple. It's more of like in some situations, I'm a victim. In some situations, I'm a creator. So how do I turn those situations where I'm a victim into situations where I'm a creator? Okay, so let's look at the other side here. So um, we have the stimulus, whatever that thing is, a choice, and then the creator mindset. So a creator is the type of person who is actually looking for constructive criticism because they're looking to change and they're looking to better themselves. Um, they will take action to make changes, and if someone says some like a suggestion, they're open to it. Um, when they ask you, hey, can you help me with this? It's because they really want help. It's not because they want just sympathy or they want you to tell them what they want. They want you to tell them what they want to hear, you know? Um, they're not afraid to try something new or do something different. And the result is that they often achieve their goals. Because obviously, like if you're on track towards a goal and you run into an obstacle and then you go, okay, well, what I'm doing isn't working. Let me ask around and figure out how to get around this obstacle. Okay, I got around the obstacle. Now I'm doing this. So of course, things are going to change and be different because instead of just letting an obstacle defeat me for the rest of my life, I'm going to go around it. I'm going to do something else. And that's kind of what you have to do if things don't work out the way that you've planned because guess what? Life never goes according to plans, even though, because a lot of people are like, well, then why do we set goals? Dr. Porchy, why do we set goals if we know on some level that those goals are not going to work out the way that we plan them? And, well, that's a good question, but I have a good answer. So the good answer is that if you don't have goals, you're not working towards something. And if you're not working towards something, you're not making progress in your life, okay? Of course... The goals that you set for yourself are not going to be forever. Sometimes it's like we achieve a goal. So we get there and we're like, okay, what's next? I need to set another goal. So sometimes there's an obstacle that comes in our in the way that really just right there, big wall. And for some of us, that means that's it. So for example, like right now I'm dating a guy who is a former NBA basketball player. Okay. And he hurt his hip. Um, and that was the end of his career. Now, when I say that that was, um, part, it wasn't part of his goal. It wasn't part of his plan. Um, but it was pretty final. Like there's no going back. You can't unhurt your hip. It's there at that time. The technology was not there to, you know, fix it. So, he had to accept that his career in that area was over and he had to figure out a different way or a different thing to do from there. And we don't always have complete control over what happens. There are a lot of things that are outside of our control. But the difference between responding as a victim and responding as a creator is that a victim would just be like, well, then my life is over. I might as well just give up on myself and go kill myself or something, right? Um, 
Whereas a creator is like, well, you know, I can't do, I can't actually play anymore. So maybe I should look into like coaching or, um, you know, running camps or something like that. So I can still be, you know, involved or whatnot. And so you have a choice when life gives you something that you weren't expecting. And there are going to be those unexpected things. So goals are there to help guide you. So remember we talked about hope theory. Um, hope theory is the theory that um, students who have high agency, meaning they think they can do it, and pathways thinking, or they know how to get there, um, are going to be the most successful students and, and get through school. Because even when those obstacles come up, they're going to be able to get around them. And that's what Pathways is. It's about figuring out how to get around those obstacles, even the really tough ones where it changes the whole trajectory of what our goals are. It doesn't mean we should give up on goals. It means we need to change our goals to reflect what's now happening. So creators are the type of people who adjust and adapt to the changes that are affecting their goals. So when their goals have to change, they're willing to change them. Whereas a victim will mourn over the loss of a goal for the rest of their life sometimes. Um, <laughs> I have a uh, uncle who is in, um, I guess he used to be a football player. And he also had an injury and that ended his career. And I kind of think it's interesting because he still talks about like, you know, football and I don't know, it's sort of like the when I played football and everything else <laughs> is the way his life is divided up. And I kind of feel like it was a really tough blow for him. And I don't know if he ever really like got over it. Um, he still watches football and does all that stuff. And um, I don't know if I told you guys that I used to be an athlete too. And I played... Um, Division one soccer in college, and I was really into soccer. I played like 20 years of my life, and when I was in my early 20s, um, I really wanted to try out for uh, the Olympic team because it was the timing was right there where there was an Olympics coming up, and um, I trained for it and everything, but I never made it to the tryout because um, I started having really bad health problems. And when I say really bad health problems, I mean, I was going into anaphylactic shock, which is like where you swell up everywhere, like every other day and have you go to the hospital. And um, it was really scary and I couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And it, it ended up turning into this like really debilitating illness for a good portion of my life. But um, instead, I decided to go back to school and get my PhD in psychology and you know, that was a different choice for me than, than I think if I had become a soccer player for the rest of my life. But the point is, is I'm not still dwelling on the fact that I can't play soccer anymore. Um, I'm more focused on the fact that, you know, now I'm a professor and I have students that, you know, that need me and I want to help you guys. And my life is good. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is, Victims have a very negative mindset, and when something goes wrong for them, like, my whole life is over, oh, that's it, it's done. Um, whereas creators are like, okay, yeah, this sucks, and this terrible bad thing happened to me, but there's life after this, and I'm going to see what's next, and I'm going to create a new life for myself with a new set of situations and circumstances, and I'm not going to let the past dictate what I'm doing now. So that's kind of the difference between a victim and a creator. And like I said, you're probably a little of both and you probably have both, but let's kind of talk a little bit about maybe what that looks like, okay? So um, let's, say that, let's say that you get a bad grade on a test, okay? Um, how would you handle that? Would you handle it like a victim or a creator? Okay, so a victim would be like, Oh, that teacher, she's such a bitch. She hates me. That's why she gave me a bad grade. I probably should just stop going to class. Because she's just going to fail me anyways. Whereas a creator would be like, well, you know, I didn't really put a lot of studying in the way that I should have. I got too busy over the weekend. I didn't study for that quiz. And I got a bad grade. And my... My whole grade's going down now, so what can I do to get it back up? Maybe I'll email my teacher and see if there's some extra credit or something that I can do to bring my grade back up or ask her how to better study for the test. Um, maybe I'll form a study group with some other students in the class so we can get better grades together. You know, just stuff like that. So 
the victim versus the creator way of thinking, you can see where victims kind of get stuck and creators sort of make new paths where there aren't any paths um, to overcome things. So that's kind of what I want to be. I want to be a creator. <laughs> and I'll say even like, you know, I'm an older woman now and whatnot, and I feel like I'm a creator in a lot of instances, but I also feel like there's some certain things where I do fall into that victim mentality too. And, I, and that's why it's so important to constantly be checking in with yourself and seeing how you're doing in all areas of your life. Um, am I, you know, am I a creator in this area? Am I a creator in that area? <laughs> am I being a victim here? Oh, I kind of am. I need to ease off that and maybe go this way instead. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about the inner critic and the inner defender and the inner guide. And I would say that's going to be on page, it's starting on page 51 in the book. And it has like some little pictures here of those things. And I think um, if you go down to slide five, which is right below that little graph in the PowerPoint, you should get the same info. So the way that victims and creators talk to themselves is quite different. And when I say talk to yourself, I mean like when you just kind of silence yourself and really listen, you can hear the inner voices in your head kind of talking. And they might be saying really positive things. They might be saying really negative things. It might be in your voice. It might be in a parent's voice or someone else's voice. That's maybe a caretaker for you. Um, Mine's always in my voice, so I don't know how other people's are, but I do. I have heard other people say mine's in my parents' voices or something like that. So the inner critic is the mean inner voice that's hard on you. So it's like you're being hard on yourself. And it says mean things like, you'll never be able to do that. Oh, you're fat and ugly. Why do you even wear that? Um, that looks ugly on you. Oh, don't eat that, you pig. You're going to get so fat. <laughs> That kind of stuff. Nobody loves me. Right. So the inner critic is is mean. And that's too bad. But that's kind of how it goes. And if you find that you have a mean inner critic, it's okay because a lot of people do. Um, you can probably um, counter it with some positive self-talk. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. All right. So the next one is the inner defender. And that's the next slide if you're looking at slides. Um, the inner defender is the voice that blames other people to kind of keep you safe from having to take responsibility. And I kind of find that my son is like this because he is 16 right now, and I kind of think 16 and inner defender are go hand in hand. It's a lot easier to blame everybody else than to focus in on yourself and what you're doing wrong. And so it's always, it's mom's fault because, it's dad's fault because, it's the school's fault because, it's my girlfriend's fault because. Um, so it's always somebody else's fault or somebody else's problem and never really my problem because I'm perfect and uh, yeah. So most people tend to either gravitate more towards using the inner defender or using the inner or <laughs> inner critic, okay? So like they're both victim voices. They're both negative voices, okay? So whether you're blaming other people or you're being hard on yourself, either way, that's not good for you. It's not constructive and it's not helping you. And so for a lot of us, we have to tell those voices to be quiet because they're not helpful. Um, so when we do hear, you know, you're fat, you're ugly, you know, we need to counter that by saying something positive. No, I'm not. I'm beautiful as I am. Shut the hell up, bad inner critic voices. <laughs> so um, let's move on to the next one, which is the inner guide. So inner guide is actually a good voice and it's a creator voice. This is a voice that is supposed to be your true voice. Um, you know, the, the voice that's kind to yourself, but also acknowledges where you screwed up. So it might say like, you know, you messed up there, but that's okay because this is the first time you've done this. Just keep going. Keep practicing. You're going to do okay eventually if you keep going. Um, oh, you failed the test? Man, that sucks. You know, your teacher's not really, like, she doesn't have it out for you. Um, you know, it's just that you didn't study well for the test. You didn't put in any time. You didn't do any other reading. You didn't watch the lectures. That's why you got a bad grade. So maybe next time you should check out the lectures and maybe take some notes on those and study. 
the material and do the reading and then maybe you'll get, do a better job on the test. So you see how the inner guide is like, they're telling it like it is and being honest, but also giving constructive feedback. Like you can also do this to overcome this situation. <clears throat> the inner guide is a, it's a, it's a creator voice. Okay, so it's there to give you um, feedback about what happened, but also guidance in terms of what to do next. Because you don't want to be a victim and just keep repeating the same things over and over again. So the other day, my son got really mad because, actually, I'm not really sure why he was so mad. He just was. He was angry for God knows what reason. Um, and... He was taking it out on his girlfriend, and he was saying mean things to her. And she said, and I thought this was really cool, she said, look, you are obviously in a very bad mood. If you're looking for somebody to take your anger out on, it's not me. I'm going to have to go. If you want to be nice to me and, you know, if you want to hang out um, and have fun, then I want to do that. But if you can't do that today because you're too upset, I am not going to be sitting here and taking your abuse. And I was just kind of listening from the other room going, bravo, girl. <laughs> well done. Um, because she, instead of just going like, oh, he's putting me down. I deserve this. Like the inner critic voice or like a victim. She was standing up for herself saying, look, I'm not going to let your bad mood affect my day. If you're not going to be nice to me, then I'm going to leave. And I thought that was really cool. Um, and I also noticed that my my son had to change his behavior in order to stay hanging out with her, which was good. But that comes down to feeling good enough about yourself to feel like you deserve to be treated better than you're being treated um, and standing up for yourself in those situations where people are mistreating you. Um, so the inner guide is what was working inside of the girlfriend to tell her like look you don't deserve this you tell him that if he wants to be nice you'll stay but if not you're gonna go because you should not put up with this because you're too good for that so when I see someone that has a really positive strong inner guide that makes me happy because that means they're gonna stand up for themselves in those situations where they're being victimized so they are not a victim and so if any of you guys are watching this and listening to this and you're thinking like you know I live in a victim situation and I can't get out of it. I just want to say there's always a way out of any situation. It may not be ideal. It may not be perfect. But there is always a way out. You always, always have a choice. And that's the thing to remember is you always have a choice. So, for example, I had students who were telling me things like, well, I have to go to college because if I don't, my parents are going to kick me out. So I'm, I have to be here. They're arguing with me about the, you know, you get to be here. Because um, I'm like, you know, no one has to be in college. You're here because you want to be here on some level or you wouldn't be here. And there's that student that's like, well, I'm here because my parents are making me go here, right? So, um, you know, ask them. So if you really don't want to be here, why are you here? And I'm like, well, I just told you. My parents are telling me they're going to kick me out if I don't go to school. And I'm like, so you do want to be here then. Because basically you're saying you want to stay living at home. And the condition is you have to go to school. So you're saying you're here of your own choice. You want to come here because if you weren't coming here, you would get kicked out of your house. You don't want to get kicked out of your house. You're here because you want to be here. And they're like, oh, that's not, that's not how it is. It's like, I don't want to be here, but I'm being forced. No, you're not being forced because you can leave. You can move out anytime you want. I'm like, well, I don't have any money. I'm like, well, if you stop going to school, then you could get a job and you could get money and you could go live wherever. Uh, you could rent a room in someone's house and they were just like mind blown because I think sometimes we really don't realize the vast number of choices that we have available to us at any given moment. We don't have to be where we are. We don't have to do what we're doing. We can just, I mean, if you wanted to right now, you could just be like, done with this book and then leave. Uh, nobody can stop you. It's your choice. So if you're here and you're taking the class, it's because you want to be here on some level or you've made a decision to come here because it will benefit you in some way. So your creator for being here. Um, 
And so I'm like, well, what if someone's victimizing me into being here? Am I then still a creator or am I a victim? And always, no matter 100%, no matter what, you have control over your choices. Whether you're a victim or a creator, you always have control. It's just whether you utilize that control or not. So if you're sitting in an abusive relationship right now, you don't have to be there and you do not have to stay there. You might seem like there's no way out, but there absolutely is. There's all kinds of like programs out there that could help you get out of that situation if you really wanted to. It's just scary. It's just it's terrifying to make changes. It's terrifying to try something you've never tried before. It's terrifying to step on a limb and do something you've never done. Um, and a lot of times, nobody can make these choices or do these things but you. You're the only person who is actually in 100% control of your life. And so some of us give up that control. We say, hey, somebody else, please take control of me. I don't want to make decisions. And when we were kids, we had our parents always making our choices for us. We didn't have 100% control over everything that happened. Um, and I would say no one has 100% control over everything that happens. But we do have 100% control as adults as to the choices that we make on a daily basis. No one can force you to study for an hour a day or to go over your notes within 24 hours of the time you took them, except you. You're the only person that can decide that school is right for you or best for you. You're the only person that can realize that it doesn't matter what type of student you are right now, that you can always improve and become better than you currently are. So if you are the type of person who is afraid to make choices or afraid to make decisions, then you may be in that victim mentality right now. But that doesn't mean that you have to stay there. You can make choices that get you out of that mentality. And so I really strongly urge you to read chapter two because chapter two in On Course is it's beautifully written. It's written for people who might be engaging in a little bit of uh, victim behavior that really just need a good like little pumping up. Like you could do this. You can change. You can do stuff. Um, it feels good to read it and to think about all the things that you might be able to do that could change your life. And maybe for some of you, that change is just like, I'm going to actually put 100% effort into school. For once, I'm going to do it 100%. In the past, I've always given a lot less than 100%. But now, I'm ready. So I would say some of you guys may be doing that this semester because of this lecture and seeing some change. So you have complete 100% control over whether you choose to be a victim or whether you choose to be a creator. You choose how you react to situations. And if you hear those negative voices in your head of the inner critic and the inner defender, the inner guide is your voice. And you can use that voice to talk back to the inner critic and the inner defender. You can tell them to shut up. You can tell them to shove it. You could tell them that you have a lot better things to do than listen to them talk about you negatively or blame other people for stuff that you should be taking responsibility for. You're 100% completely <laughs> in charge of what happens in your thought process. But I guess to be able to really tap into that, you have to listen to what you are saying to yourself. And so I would give this as a challenge for you guys just for this week. Go around and listen to what is being said in your head to yourself. Like what kind of, how do you talk to yourself? Do you talk to yourself in a positive way or a negative way? And just so you know, like I used to really talk to myself in a negative way. Um, it was really sad. So I would um, say really bad things to myself like, you know, I'm fat, I'm ugly, no one loves me, and I can see why because I'm not very lovable. And there's a lot of negative things that I would say to myself and the thing is, is, I didn't realize I was even saying those things to myself. I had no idea until I started listening to the inner voices. Um, and I kind of read a book similar to On Course, which you're reading now. And uh, it opened my eyes. I was like, oh my gosh, um, I am saying negative stuff. So how do I change that? And one of the ways I change that is through affirmations, which we'll talk about um, next week so you can stay tuned for that but for this week what I would like you to do is just kind of get a feel for how you talk to yourself do you primarily use the inner defender the inner guide 
or the inner critic? Um, which one is your primary mode of communicating with yourself? Uh, mine was the inner critic and I was able to kind of counteract that. So uh, let me see. Um, there is a little bit on what we call the language of responsibility. And that's, um, I think, on page 53. There's it's this little graph down here. And I think it goes on to the next page here. Um, it's also in slide 8 on the PowerPoint. So the language of responsibility, victim language versus creator language. This is one thing you can use to start changing things for yourself. Is if you hear something said in victim language, then you can translate it into creator language kind of as you're going through your day. So um, I'm just going to go through these. So a victim focuses on their weaknesses, whereas a creator focuses on how to improve. So if you hear yourself say like, you're a loser, then creator says, well, you know, maybe you've had some losses here, but that doesn't mean that you always have to be a loser. What are some things you can do to actually be a winner in this situation? Then you can start thinking about that. Um, a victim makes excuses. It's not my fault. <laughs> Creators are like, who cares who's at fault? How do we solve the problem? That's kind of how I am now. I don't care who, like, you got in a car accident? Okay, whatever. Don't care whose fault it is. How do we get the car fixed? <laughs> All right, so um, victims complain and creators turn complaints into requests for help, okay? Um, victims compare oneself unfavorably to other people, like everybody else is always better than they are. Um, creators look towards skilled people for help. So like she obviously knows what she's doing. She's really good. Um, and I had to sh sh uh, kind of shift to do that. When I became a writer, um, I realized that I wasn't going to be the best writer that was out there. There was always going to be somebody better than me. And um, at first, that seemed a little bit intimidating, and I was always kind of afraid to talk to those people who were better than I was that had more experience. But as I've gotten better in myself, and I've had more experience now myself, I kind of see those people who are doing better than I am, especially in sales, uh, book sales and things like that. I look to them to get clarity about how they, how do they do it so I can kind of maybe monitor model my situation after what they're doing because they're having success so maybe I can learn from them and what I found is most people when you ask them for help like that like hey so how do you set up your stuff because I see you're doing really well and I would love to be successful as well they're very flattered they're happy to help you um, I would say the best-selling author in my genre um, I reached out to her and she actually reached back and she spent like a couple hours on the phone with me um, talking to me about like what I can do to improve my stuff. So and she didn't have to do that. It was just like she was just being nice. And honestly, like she said, nobody really reaches out to her because they're intimidated by her or whatever. So the fact that like I was able to reach out and not be like super jealous of her, but instead be like respectful, like, wow, she's somebody that I aspire to be like and I want her help. Um, it really got me to a better place because because I was willing to ask for that help. Um, okay, so victims blame other people and creators accept responsibility for what's theirs and nothing more. Um, victims see problems as permanent. And a lot of times they are because they're not actually changing stuff. So if they're not doing anything differently, those problems are going to be permanent. Um, and creators treat problems as temporary, like we'll get through this. It's going to, this is going to pass. Um, victims keep doing the same ineffective things over and over again. So they like keep, they're the kind of person that just keeps trying the same thing, even though it hasn't worked. And you're like, why do they keep trying that? But they do. Um, creators keep trying different new stuff until they figure out a solution. Victims try. <laughs> creators do. Um, victims predict defeat and then they give up. So they might give up before they even begin. So if I had done that, I would never be where I am. Uh, you know, I wouldn't even be a teacher because I would always be like, oh, you know, I'll never make it. Um, creators think positively and look for better choices. So, I mean, essentially, being a creator is going to get you more in life and get you to where you need to go. So you definitely want to be there. Um, the other thing I wanted to go over from this chapter is, uh, besides victim and creator, is the wise choice process. And for those of you on the PowerPoint, that's back at slide three. And for those of you in your book, it is um, actually starting on page 58 here, um, the wise choice process. And then it kind of just keeps going. And it's pretty long. 
uh, this section um, goes all the way until the journal that we're doing for homework this week, which is on the wise choice process. So um, the homework is on this, so I kind of wanted to make sure I go over it so you guys understand that. So basically the wise choice process is a set of six steps. And you're just supposed to ask these questions of yourself as you're trying to solve a problem. And so um, I'm actually trying to solve a problem right now. Maybe you guys can help me. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <clears throat> but I'm going to go through it. Maybe talking about it right now will help me. I'm literally going to jump into this as soon as I'm done recording this video. So um, step one, what is my present situation? So let me explain to you what my present situation is. Um, I ha have this book that I've written. And it's all edited. I had an editor come in, edit it for me, um, did all the changes. It's um, it's on pre-sale right now for the ebook, but I have to format the uh, the actual paperback book. But I'm selling it through a really kind of strange vendor that I've sort of done with, I've sold with before. But for some reason, they've updated Microsoft Office in my, and I did do all my formatting in Microsoft Office, and, um, and I'm supposed to be able to do it for Microsoft Word, but I can't seem to get this thing formatted. Every time I think I get it right, there's always like some weird thing that I can't figure out. And I followed the directions and some of other people have suggested to me, you know, they've updated Microsoft Word um, and now it does weird stuff when you're formatting, so that may be it. Um, so yeah, so that's what's going on. I'm struggling with formatting and that book drops on October 1st, so I've got until then to kind of get it together, but I also have to have my time, a little bit of time, so the girl who's doing my book cover can do the sizing properly because you kind of have to have the inside done so you can see how big the spine has to be. Yeah. So that's my present situation. Step two, how would I like my situation to be? Okay. So you think about your situation and how you would like your situation to be. I will think about mine. Um, I would like to be done formatting this book already. I've been trying for like literally two weeks um, to get it formatted correctly. And it's been probably, I've probably tried 50 different times, 50 different ways. So I would like it to be done, formatted. Um, step three, what are my possible choices? Okay, so I've thought about this. And you think about yours. What are your possible choices? Now, I could do nothing. Like, that is a choice still. And I want you to always think about that. Like, I could just be like, you know what? I'm not going to do a paperback version. Oh, well, buy the ebook. <laughs> I mean, I could. But I have had people already reach out and tell me I can't wait to get the paperback. So I feel kind of bad not doing that. But I could just be like tough. <laughs> can't seem to get it formatted so tough um, I could hire someone else to do it for me but I'm gonna be honest with you this is a very um, obscure little site that I'm publishing it on so not too many people are familiar with it um, I might be able to pay someone who works at that website to do it for me that gives me a new solution right there maybe I could reach out and ask the website like I could email them and be like I'm doing this on Microsoft Word and your directions are not working what am I doing wrong? Can you help me? Maybe they can help me. I didn't even think to do that. Silly. To see how sometimes like just talking about it or just verbalizing it out loud um, kind of helps you come up with things that you could have done. Um, I have looked into combining PDFs because I have to turn it into like this giant PDF document and I can get like pieces of it correct. So I'm like, okay, maybe if I get the pieces, then I can combine those pieces I even bought Adobe Acrobat thinking that I could do this, but I was running into problems because it won't size it to the right size. So maybe that's still a possibility in terms of fixing things, but so far it hasn't been. Um, I could try using a different program besides Microsoft Office um, or besides Microsoft Word. Um, there is a way to do it via Pages, which I do have Mac, so I could try it with Pages. I think that may be my next step. I don't know. Um, so step four. What is the likely outcome of each possible choice? All right, so I kind of did say that as I was going through it, but I would say um, if I ask someone else to do it, they're probably going to have the same problems as I'm having, but maybe they're better or well-versed with Microsoft Word to where they can overcome those obstacles. And I know a lot of people just do formatting. Um, I don't really want to spend any more money on this book because I don't think it's going to make me tons of money because it's kind of a weird little, it's just a weird little thing that isn't really my normal thing. And I think 
usually when you're an author, people kind of want the same stuff over and over again. So that's why I'm publishing in kind of a different place. And yeah. So I don't know. Um, I kind of feel like if I contact the company, that might be the best choice um, or it just might be part of the choices that I could do. I Because I, I think with this, maybe I could try more than one thing at once and kind of see whatever ends up working. I feel like giving up and not having a paperback is the possibility. I think people might be upset that they, if I do that because I've been kind of already advertising that I will have a paperback, but because I'm an indie author, like a lot of, a lot of my fans are more forgiving than if I was like someone who was with a publishing house or something like that. So step five, which choices will I commit to doing? Oh, well, okay. So having thought about it for the two seconds uh, that I've had here, I really like the idea of contacting the company because if their instructions are wrong and I'm struggling with them, there's a chance that probably other people are also struggling. So maybe by contacting them, I can alert them of a problem that's affecting not just me. So, um, and I might actually get an answer that's helpful and they may be able to help me. Um, I also feel like I could look into maybe having somebody do it for me. Um, and then at the same time, I think today I'm going to try it on pages instead of Microsoft Office and see if maybe that goes more smoothly because at this point I'm just so frustrated. I don't know pages that well, but I assume if I just follow the instructions that maybe it'll give me the answer I'm looking for. So uh, step six, when and how will I evaluate my plan? Okay, it's September 14th right now, so I'm actually going to give myself a week to come up with some kind of a solution here. And then that gives my uh, my book cover girl at least a, a week to get the book cover ready based off of what I got. And I think that will give me what I'm looking for. So I feel like I have just troubleshooted. I've found, I have a plan now and this is awesome because I'm about to go work on this right now and I was feeling like really like, oh, I don't want to deal with this. But now that I've gone through the wise choice process, I feel rejuvenated and kind of excited about it because there are some new potential solutions on the horizon for me. And it'll work for you too if you allow it to. So you will be doing a journal in the wise choice process this week and you will be required to come up with a problem yourself and go through the choices. Um, and I think it will help you as well. And that is it for chapter two. So you have a good rest of the day and um, I will see you in the next video.